Okay, dear colleagues, uh, again, good morning, Professor Stieglitz in New York. It's 8.15 in Germany, it's a quarter past uh, two. I am Herman Simon, uh, one of the founders and um, honorary chairman of Simon Kutcher and Partners. It is a great honor to have you as a key speaker in our Simon Kutcher World Meeting, Professor Stieglitz. This year, everything is virtual. Last year, it was very different, and uh, I will show that to you. This, this was a meeting last year, so <laughs> very, very different. But we hope it will again be the same next year. And uh, Josef Stieglitz is the is a professor at Columbia University, and in 2009, you received the Nobel Prize in Economics, officially called the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences. And you are also a former vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and a former member and chairman of the US President's Council of Economics economic advisors. Time magazine even named you as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And without doubt, you are one of the five or 10 most influential economists in the world. And I think there's a reason for that, because you speak on really relevant pressing issues and not so much on uh, quantitative models and uh, theoretical topics. With your lecture, you are actually continuing a tradition. Years ago, we had the late uh, Professor Reinhard Zelten as a speaker at the same meeting, but we had only 100 people at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of our first generation uh, consultants and leaders studied under him. And I was a colleague of him at the University of Bielefeld. And I'm also conveying personal greetings from Professor uh, Karl Christian von Weizsäcker, whom I uh, talked to yesterday and he asked me to do that. Mm -hmm. Professor Stieglitz, we look forward to your remarks. The screen is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure. I wish I could have been there with that uh, large group of people, uh, but we've all learned to adapt. And the question I was uh, uh, asked to talk about is what's next? And of course, uh, if we think about what's next, uh, the, the most important news is the arrival of the vaccine. And that means there's light at the end of this tunnel. Uh, it means that we can see a uh, time, uh, whether it's four months or eight months, 12 months from now, when this, uh, this scourge of COVID-19 will be behind us. But between now and then, uh, we're going to go, be going through a difficult time. And uh, at the same time, the last, what we've, gone through in the last nine months, 12 months, has taught us a great deal. So I think the, there's at least a reasonable chance that the post-pandemic world will be different in several salient ways from the world that we had before. So let me begin first by talking a little bit about uh, the economic outlook. Um, at the beginning of the crisis, a lot of people talked about there being a V-shaped recovery. Uh, that might have been the case if there had been a short six week, 10 week interruption. Uh, what we needed for that was to make sure that things, uh, a level keel was maintained for a few weeks and then we pick up where we left off. But it's now been nine months, 10 months, and it's clear that in that period of time, uh, there's been a lot of damage done to the economy. Many firms have gone bankrupt. Households have had their balance sheets uh, eviscerated. Uh, corporations net worth has gone down. Uh, and so uh, this, uh, 
this kind of damage is not going to be undone in just a few weeks. Um, that's why, for instance, the Federal Reserve is taking a very cautious stand. Uh, it doesn't think that we will be really back to normal until sometime in 2020 uh, to 2023. So um, I think we have to gird ourselves for uh, a long period of uh, recovery. How long that will be will depend on how much damage gets done uh, between now and uh, the time the pandemic is put under control. And that depends to a large extent on the kinds of policies that are put in place. The United States had a set of policies that were very impressive in size, but not very well designed in structure. It was like a bazooka. We, we, we uh, spent $3 trillion uh, and the Federal Reserve expanded its balance sheet by another roughly $3 trillion. Uh, it mitigated uh, the size of the downturn, but didn't stop millions of millions of people from losing their job. And most importantly, when that assistance from the federal government came to an end in June, nothing was done. Uh, they are now on the verge of passing uh, another uh, uh, aid package, uh, probably under a $1 trillion that will not go to some of the most important needs of our, our economy, and most importantly, the states and localities. About a third of all government expenditure in the United States is uh, associated with the states and localities. They have a balanced budget uh, framework, which means when the revenues go down, they have to cut back their spending. The revenues have plummeted by hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, and uh, that means it is simply unlikely that we will have a strong recovery unless we have assistance for the states and localities. These are the uh, public sector that provides education and health and um, so many of the other basic services. And uh, for reasons that are hard to understand, uh, the Republicans are refusing to include aids to states and localities in, in their package. Uh, I'm hopeful that come January, there will be uh, a new package uh, with a new administration, but uh, that's uh, for time to tell and, and to see how the politics uh, 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 emerge. As we went through the uh, crisis, we learned a lot, both about our society, our government, uh, 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 about our economy, uh, and about different Economies. In a way, it was like a natural experiment. You know, in economics and social sciences, sciences, you can't do the kind of experiments that you do in chemistry and other real sciences. Uh, what we've had is uh, an experience, uh, a virus that's afflicted countries all over the world, and they've responded in quite different ways. And some have done a much, much better job, a job in controlling the virus. Uh, some have done a much better job of controlling the economic uh, aftermath. Some have done a terrible job. Uh, I live in a country that's done both uh, badly. Uh, countries like New Zealand have done both uh, an amazingly impressive job, uh, both controlling the virus and in controlling the economic aftermath. And so uh, I'm sure there's going to be uh, a lot of research thinking about what makes for success. And many things that have made for success in responding to the virus are ingredients of things that make for success in long-term economic growth. For instance, in my uh, recent book, People, Power, and Profits, I, I return to the question that Adam Smith had asked many years ago, uh, 1776, the wealth of nations, which was what gives rise to the wealth of nations? And uh, there were two ideas. One was that was learning about science, uh, learning about nature, the development of science. Uh, and the second was social organization, uh, how we uh, in a complex society work together. 
doing more that we could do individually. Well, the countries that relied on science did much better than those that didn't trust the scientists. Uh, it's really a, a shame that the United States, we had one of the best scientific institutions, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, uh, taught countries all over the world how to deal with infectious diseases. And yet uh, the Trump administration did not trust them, defunded them, disempowered them. Uh, and uh, we've all seen the consequence. Uh, we've just reached uh, reaching the record where more people have been killed by COVID-19 in the United States than died in World War II, showing the magnitude of the tragedy that we've experienced. Uh, the second thing I mentioned was social organization. And here, governments in which there was trust uh, performed much better than those where there was not. Uh, and it was a self-reinforcing uh, process. Countries where the government responded effectively and efficiently uh, gained more trust and that in turn led to uh, better responses. So uh, these are among, I think, uh, the lessons uh, that we learn about uh, what makes for a successful economy, not just in addressing disaster, but in long-term economic growth. What we learned was that 40 years of denigrating the role of government, 40 years in which people said government was the problem, not the solution, resulted in government not being able to step up to deal with the problem. We always turn to government when there's a problem in terms of disaster, in terms of emergencies. Um, Michael Lewis wrote a, a very uh, influential and popular book uh, a few years before the pandemic, talking about how the Trump administration was weakening our ability to respond to the risks that we face and the critical role that government plays in helping us address those risks. The irony that among the risks he talked about was not the pandemic, but we've been warned about the risk of a pandemic, both by SARS, MERS, Ebola, uh, and on the Obama administration, we set up a White House Office of uh, Pandemic uh, to deal with pandemics. But then the Trump administration disbanded uh, the very office that was designed to help us address uh, this crisis. So one of the lessons I think, hope that we take out of, of uh, this terrible episode is that we do need a better balance between the government, the market, civil society. Uh, and uh, we lost that balance and we would have been much better positioned to respond to the crisis if we had had a better balance. One of the things that many Americans were struck with was the fact that our market economy did not, was. Uh, lacked resilience. Uh, you know, we think of our economy uh, being so powerful. We couldn't even produce masks. We couldn't produce protective gear. We had to import these, uh, uh, and, and there was a scramble to get them. Uh, we couldn't produce more complicated products like tests and, and ventilators. Um, what we learned from that was something that we learned from the 2008 crisis. Markets are sometimes excessively short-sighted. Uh, I illustrate that by talking about what's happened in the United States with spare tires in our cars. Uh, many companies have taken out the spare tires. They saved a little bit of money. Uh, after all, how often do you need a spare tire? But uh, when you're driving 100 miles for 200 miles from the nearest gas station and you have a flat tire, you regret not having a spare tire. And the few pennies you saved uh, up front uh, are not worth the cost that you bear down the line. And uh, there was, I think, on the part of at least many enterprises, an excessive focus on short-term savings, on uh, saving money in the short run. 
in the United States, we prided ourselves that we have no empty hospital beds. But of course, when uh, you, you have a, a, a crisis, you need to have uh, excess supply of hospital beds. So those are two of the things that uh, I think we've, we've learned. We need to have a more resilient economy and we need to have uh, a stronger uh, capacity of government to respond to the crises we face. Now, as I look across uh, the ocean at uh, Europe and how it's responded to the crisis, uh, there are some, several things that I found uh, very impressive. And let me mention a, a couple of them. Uh, in the 2010 Euro crisis, many of us thought that uh, Europe should pull together, issue uh, Euro bonds, uh, issue bonds to help finance jointly the recovery uh, from uh, the Euro crisis. Uh, more debt by Spain or Greece at the time was not viable. It had to be done uh, through Europe as a whole. There was reluctance at the time to do that. And the breakthrough this time of issuing these uh, common bonds uh, to help finance uh, 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 Europe's recovery, I think is uh, a, a historic event. Another aspect in Europe that I was very criticized in the Euro crisis was the focus on austerity. Um, it led to these very deep depressions in Greece and, and very deep downturns in Spain and Ireland. Um, the good news again is that Europe has put austerity behind. Uh, it said, you know, this is not the time for austerity. This is the time for expansion. The third thing that's very impressive about the European response has been that uh, the commitment to make as much of the funds directed at recovery from the pandemic do dual or triple purpose. That is to say that the funds be uh, used not only to help the economy recover, but help Europe move towards the green transition. Uh, in the United States, we use the term uh, build back better. Uh, we realized that the world that we left in January uh, 2020 was not the best of all worlds. Uh, and we've seen uh, some of the manifestations of that, uh, the uh, way that the virus has particularly affected uh, the poor, uh, both in terms of their income and in terms of uh, the experiences they have had in death and disease. So I think it's important that as we build back better, we think about how to create a more uh, equal society, a greener economy, and a more knowledge-based economy. We were going through a transition from manufacturing to a service sector to a knowledge economy. That's, those transitions are difficult. And I, I think the, the commitment to use as much of the funds as possible uh, that are going to be necessary to recover from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, to try to uh, create the, the kind of European economy uh, that one needs for the 21st century uh, is, is very uh, welcome. So uh, as we, uh, final set of comments I'll make is as we, as we look at this moment, um, it's, pandemic is a, a global uh, disease, uh, affliction, uh, it's affected all the countries in the world. Uh, we've been through a period in which global cooperation uh, has not been uh, the best in the world. Uh, Trump uh, was not good for promoting working together. But January uh, 2021, uh, we'll have a new president and a president who I think is more committed to working together. Uh, we have to work together to address the common problems we face around the world, the pandemic being the most important one we face right now, climate change, um, having an international rules-based system of trade uh, and uh, um, economic interchange, uh, uh, 
exchange rate movements, and so forth. So all of these are areas where global cooperation is absolutely essential. Uh, we won't recover from this disease until we have a recovery everywhere, which means that we have to make sure some way or other, we, the vaccine is made available to those in poorer countries. And we won't have a strong global economy, economic recovery until we have an economic recovery uh, everywhere. Um, I talked before about the bill, trillions of dollars that the United States uh, has uh, spent um, in uh, its economic recovery. The emerging markets and the uh, developing countries don't have the resources to do that. In the 2008 crisis, China played a, a very big role in the global economic recovery, but its growth is more muted now and it's a much more inward looking growth. And so it's going to be even more important that the developing countries and emerging markets uh, uh, emerge strongly and quickly from this crisis. At the IMF, there's an important insta uh, mechanism for doing that. SDR, special drawing rights, is kind of global money. Uh, the head of the IMF has called for a $500 billion issuance of SDRs. For no good reason, the Trump administration vetoed that. I hope that this is one of the first things on the agenda uh, of the next administration and that there will be a resolve to uh, approve this uh, at the IMF. There are gonna be other issues that we'll have to work to, together on globally. Uh, many of the countries were over indebted before the pandemic. Uh, now they face a debt crisis and they won't be able to address either their health needs or the economic recovery unless we handle these debt crises better than we have in the past. So I'm hopeful that having gone through uh, this terrible trauma for the last year, that we will emerge stronger, better understanding for what makes for success and for failure, more resolved to work together to try to do what is needed to needs to be done to make sure that we have a successful recovery from the pandemic and we merge from that with a stronger, greener, uh, long-term uh, growth path going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stieglitz. Uh, I found that concise, very interesting. I liked your spare tire metaphor. In Germany, we do the opposite sometimes and put two spare tires into <laughs> the car. So we are a little too uh, risk averse. I have 25 questions. Did you reserve the whole day? And uh, many of them are complex, but very good. Uh, first, I combine two questions related to China. Your view on China getting stronger, et cetera. And then there was a question, what can we learn from China with regard to the, the, the pandemic, to COVID-19? Well, China is one of the countries that did respond well to uh, COVID-19. And obviously in the beginning, it, it did not uh, it, it try to hide it. But uh, once it was uh, recognized, uh, they responded very strongly, but with measures that probably would be hard to be accepted in more democratic societies. Yeah. And that's why I emphasized uh, the success of countries like Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan. Uh, these were countries that were basically able to get the disease under control, uh, eliminate it without using authoritarian methods, without using uh, the kind of strong surveillance technologies. And I think that's important that uh, what, what COVID-19 was about in some sense was individuals had to show respect for each other and trust their governments and trust science. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the sad things uh, in the United States was that it was politicized. 
And there was one strand of thought that said, if you make me wear a mask, you're taking away my freedom. But your freedom is somebody else's, I call it unfreedom. If yes. uh, you give That's me- That's the definition of Immanuel Kant, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that uh, if you do something that gives me COVID-19, I lose my freedom to live. And that's more important than your freedom not to wear a mask. Yeah, yeah. And in the complex society, we have to balance these things out. And the societies where there's trust and respect for each other figured out good ways of balancing these out, some better than others, but that was basically uh, the, the, you know, the story. On the economy, uh, it, China is the one country that is growing strongly this year. Uh, four, five, six percent. Uh, we don't know the exact numbers, but uh, um, what's the worry to me is that uh, there are these tensions growing between the United States, China, and um, with, with Europe and other countries caught in the crosshairs between this conflict. Let me just say a couple of words about that. Uh, what's happened in the last few years in China, it ought to be a concern for everybody. You know, the, uh, the, what's happened with the suppression of democracy in Hong Kong, the Uyghurs. I think we can't just, you know, with the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall, there was the hope that openness would lead to convergence. Francis Fukuyama wrote a book called The End of History. We would all become liberal democracies and free market economies. Yeah, It's not, it's not happening uh, as fast as we would have liked. And we have to recognize the reality of uh, this change and that uh, we need to find ways of cooperating. And at the same time, speaking out strongly for our beliefs in human rights and democracy. Yeah. And then there was, of course, is of course the obvious, obvious question, how do you reconcile Wall Street and Main Street? Well, um, I don't find the, the boom in the stock market uh, that surprise. Uh, I talked about the $3 trillion that the government, federal government put in, $3 trillion, the Federal Reserve. That's a lot of money. And uh, it, for people at the top, uh, they didn't spend much of that money. The savings rate in the second quarter of, the, uh, of this year went up to 25% in the United States. This is a country where the normal savings rate is about two, three, four, five percent mm -hmm. So people were taking that money and, and, and putting it aside. And what would you do, have a zero interest rate in a bond or put your money in the stock market? So for the upper half of America, um, there was a lot of money and it was going into the equity market and a lot of it into the high tech in the tech sector. Uh, but this is often happens uh, in an economic downturn, interest rates go down, wages don't do well, profits go up, and the stock market looks like it's doing much better than the rest of the economy. The, the, so the, the Main Street and Wall Street often don't move in tandem. And the important point is pay attention to Main Street, not Wall Street. Mm -hmm. there, there are several questions. We have now a little over 500 uh, participants and most of them are young. And so they are very concerned about the burden the future uh, generation has to carry and also about inflation. Several questions were related to these issues. How do you see that uh, the, the government can deal, the state can deal with this problem? Well, it's very natural given uh, the magnitude of the increase of the debt, uh, the magnitude of uh, the government programs, the deficit GDP ratio in the United States, uh, this year is somewhere around 18%, uh, you know, uh, compared to the uh, uh, European rules, fiscal uh, uh, growth and stability pact, 
uh, these are numbers that you have unheard of. Yeah, yeah. I'm not worried. And let me You're tell not you worried. What, I'm not worried. The interest rate is close to zero. Servicing the debt doesn't cost anything. Uh, the first priority is keeping people alive, keeping the economy going. Now, sometime in the future, there will be an adjustment. We, we emerged from World War II with high levels of debt. We grew the economy and that debt became manageable. And uh, I think the same thing is going to be true here. Uh, we, if we can grow our economy in a green way, which I think we can, uh, that debt will become manageable. At the same time, uh, in the United States, we have uh, lots of room for imposing taxes uh, that will actually help the economy. Uh, we don't have. Uh, any environmental taxes to speak of, uh, that would help move our economy to a better uh, environmental posture. Uh, we have a regressive tax system. People at the top pay a lower tax rate than those down below. If we just made our tax system fair, we would raise trillions of dollars of more revenue. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of things that we can do that would redirect our economy more to creating wealth, uh, take away some of the monopoly profits and use them for public purpose. Uh, so I'm actually hopeful that we will be e able to, to manage this. Finally, uh, the Federal Reserve has shown itself to be extraordinarily professional and competent uh, responding uh, to situation and, and uh, if there were any significant worry about inflation, right now the problem is more deflation. If there are any significant worry of inflation, I believe they would act in a in a very forceful and resolute way. Thank you very much. Uh, regrettably, our time is over, but it was a very valuable thirty minutes, and uh, that you gave us an optimistic outlook for the economy and for dealing with this uh, inflation and. Uh, that problem is very important for our people. Professor, oh, good. stay healthy. You too. Merry thank Christmas. You. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.